Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I hope everybody was able to uh, find some good things to eat for lunch. Um, we're uh, really excited about the second half um, of, the, of, the, of the symposium program today. Um, in particular, the tribute to Lester, which is going to happen in the second half. But before we get there, we get to talk about the future. Um, so, so session three is, is going to look at where, uh, where we are going and what lies ahead for cannabis uh, and psychedelics and medicine policy and the culture at large, and also what role can drug policy and, and, and the use of drugs play in reflecting and even enacting uh, positive social change. So one bit of, of bad news, we just heard that Rick Doblin, who was supposed to appear on this panel, um, was unable to come due to a minor uh, medical issue. Um, but one of the amazing things about gathering a, a group of people like this in one place is that it was actually pretty easy to, to pick his replacement, though there were many, many choices. So I guess um, narrowing it down was the challenge. But, but Dustin Sulak um, has been able to step in for Rick Doblin. So he will appear on the panel um, along with Cassandra Fadrique, Shailene Title, and of course, uh, Dick Evans, who will be our moderator. So take it away, Dick. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, it's a hazardous thing, as you know, to talk about the future. Reminds me of an old joke. What do you call a prophet who is consistently wrong with his predictions about the future? A nonprofit. <laughs> I've got another one. One more. The birthday card that says, Forget the past, you can't change it. Forget the future, you can't predict it. And forget the present, I didn't get you one. <laughs> we have a great panel this afternoon. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here with Celine Tidal, an old friend of mine who we met on the barricades in, the, in Massachusetts uh, battles years ago. She was the, uh, one of the first commissioners of cannabis, a title I always wanted myself. Um, and I have to say, she wouldn't be a, a um, she wouldn't be a, a wouldn't be been a commissioner of cannabis if it weren't for me. I say that immodestly, and the reason is because one of the things I did as a member of the drafting committee for the 2016 initiative was <laughs> to change the name of the regulatory agency from the Marijuana Control Commission to the Cannabis Control Commission. So we're <laughs> cannabis. Thank you. Cassandra Frederica is, is, uh, is the head of the Drug Policy Alliance, the preeminent organization uh, of lobbying and active for reform in, uh, in drug policy. And, and I'm really keen to hear what you can bring us. Uh, the DPA has their hands on what's happening in the states and the feds. And I'm particularly here, eager to hear what's, what's uh, a report from Oregon, where DPA was very, very active in promoting the broad decriminalization initiative that, that passed out there last uh, two years ago. And our, our stand-in panelist today is Dustin Sudak, the preeminent cannabinopathic physician in the state of Maine, who uh, is, we'll let him introduce himself when he gets to it, but uh, I think he has some strong views too about where we're going. So I will, pose a couple of questions here, and then turn it over to our panelists. The first question I would pose is, how will society change in coming years, or what social change will we witness as a consequence of the drug policy reforms that we've seen and which Lester helped inspire? And if I had to whittle it down a little further, I'd pose the question this way. What hope do we have that our country will ever come to its senses on the subject of drug policy. I'm keen to hear what you both say about that, and I hope you'll both share your craziest counterintuitive uh, predictions about the future. With that, let me introduce Shalene Title. Thank you, Dick. Gosh. <laughs> what hope do we have that our country will come to its senses? Um, that's a tough question, but I will say 
that today being especially a tough day, there is no room of people that I would rather be in than this one. I want to start out by saying how many of my real life heroes are in this room having been in the drug policy movement and uh, cannabis regulation in particular, uh, there are so many people in this room that are the example of moral clarity, um, fearlessness, courage, and sometimes we disagree, but knowing that someone is intrinsically motivated, not by power or by profit, uh, we're part of the same struggle. So I'm so honored to be uh, part of this today. As far as where we're going, I think we're very much at a crossroads. My specialty is in cannabis regulations in particular. Um, we're, we're pretty far along in the state level. Um, but when I think about the way that opinions have changed, the way that we're seeing social changes and what might happen next. I would boil it down to my biggest fear being that we are on a path where the cannabis industry will look like every other industry in a lot of ways, but particularly in the sense of three to five or less companies uh, in charge of the market, only looking after their own profit. Um, and I'll just, uh, for this question, I'll, I'll leave it at this. Uh, recently, when I saw the baby formula shortage, there was a headline um, in some stock magazine that said, babies are not able to get formula, comma, but profits look good for X, Y, and Z stock. And I really thought to myself, you know, especially knowing the way that people use cannabis, um, and the similarities in terms of the necessity of a product and the particular product that you might need. Um, if we are on a path to look like the baby formula industry, I'd rather not go down it at all. I would rather just stop. But luckily, um, I think there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic. Um, I will tell you about my uh, government experience in another question, um, but I think there is uh, so much hope for the people in this room to actually chart the real path that we're going to go down. Uh, let me ask uh, uh, Cassandra, what do you think? What are the chances that our nation will come to its senses on drug policy? Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't think our, our nation has come to its senses on the fact that people are actually people and that all different kinds of people have rights um, that are inalienable, right? So I'm not, ooh, all right now. Um, I don't have hope in our nation. I have hope in the people that live here. And I think that's a distinction because the state um, as itself has shown over and over again that it will work to, to legislate against its people. You know, I think a lot of us were here when we saw the decision that just came out from SCOTUS around uh, the Dobbs decision. And you know, I said this last month where like a world or a nation that is on the brink of regulating cannabis and making it illegal for people who can be pregnant to make choices around their reproductive lives is not, is not a nation I'm worth or willing to fight for. Um, but I think the thing that gives me hope is the response that people are having across the country where people are creating the mutual aid and the structures and the supports and are saying actively that I am willing to break the law. That is actually what I have hope for. That I think that a lot of people in this nation recognize that our institutions and our structures are illegitimate. And I think a lot of the people in this room have always called the cannabis laws illegitimate, right? And we've always had our own versions of protesting and pushing past where we think what society and what the nation has said was acceptable and have done other things, right? We're here, Lester Fest, because Lester thought those laws were illegitimate, right? 
and was willing to write about them and push and take on the consequences of being in that position. Um, so I think to your question, I have no hope in the nation. I don't think that is, I think it's historically inaccurate for me to have hope um, in this nation in the way that it was constructed considering what I look like, right? Um, but I do have hope in the people. And I think in our conversations around drug policy, it's getting deeper. People are having like different conversations. They're more nuanced. They're more rigorous. Um, and I think, you know, oftentimes as someone who works at Drug Policy Alliance that has come into the movement in the last decade, uh, you know, some of the things that newer activists are asking of the drug policy reform movement aren't necessarily things people asked of the drug policy reform movement 30 years ago. And I think there can there's sometimes tension in that, but I find a lot of hope in it because it shows that uh, as people are coming into the space, we recognize that drugs are in and of themselves are helpful for many things, but they're also a pathway for a broader conversation around democratic principles and ideals that we've always known when we've talked about autonomy. But you know, when talking, oh my goodness. Um, my mom hates when I'm that loud, so I'm trying to speak lower. Um, I think that as we have conversations about drug policy, what are our hopes? I think for me, it's really the opportunity for our movement to get bigger because we can build democratic ideals and ties across different movements, right? This, the day that we are having the irony of me being here in a cannabis forum talking about the advancements of cannabis and psychedelics and the rights and all the things that we're doing where a 50-year law gets overturned, right? It shows how tenuous our wins are, right? And what and my hope is that the people that are doing this work recognize um, how fragile our wins are and the necessity for us to actually do deep investment with other movements that hold our principles around autonomy and democracy and liberty and freedom in a way that we actually really tie those things together so that we have the firewall to push back when our nation turns against us, which it has consistently done in multiple ways. It's not just the conversation around abortion, the conversation about the Voting Rights Act that has been getting gutted for the last decade, right? Like our rights that we consistently win are tenuous. Um, because the infrastructure, the nation state that we're in, has always been, uh, has always had the opportunity to turn against its people. So when, we, when you ask me, do I have hope in the nation? Absolutely not. Do I have hope in the people? Yes. Um, and I think that what's critical for us to move forward and what I think drug policy has the ability to do is to build the, the broader democratic conversation about our ideals around autonomy, humanity, and the basic rights of individuals. Can you, imagine, can you imagine any single event that's going to trigger some major change in federal policy? What is it, Shalene? Um, well, you know, wait, wait, this is a conversation. All right, all right. Tell us, talk a bit, a bit of Shalene, about the paths of legalization, federal legalization, if you can, okay. and uh, what might that triggering event be? Okay. Um, can I go on for a minute? I'll shut up after. Okay. Okay. You're, you're on. I want to work out this, this thought. So, um, okay, let me start by saying that um, when I was a commissioner here in Massachusetts for three years, it feels like I was sent on, like, aliens abducted me and took me to this other planet, and then, like, I came back here, and now I'm, like, settled in, and I can tell you all what it was like on this other planet. <laughs> The most important thing that I can convey is that it's really hard to be a policymaker because you are incentivized to do the least, to hope the least, to give people the least hope. And if you try, um, you get a lot of pushback inside and outside of where you are. But the times that it's really helpful is when people who are directly impacted come and tell you their problems and they propose solutions. I could give you a lot of examples from when that actually went well for us. So keeping that in mind, 
Um, I don't know a lot about how Congress works or how federal policy works, but I think um, there are a lot of people in this space right now clamoring that also don't know, so we're all kind of in it together. I think the big triggering event is going to be when interstate commerce is allowed. And not just when, but how. And the thought I would like to um, unwrap is uh, another absolutely terrible Supreme Court decision day was my first year of law school when I was in con law when Gonzalez v. Rage came out. And as I'm sure uh, most people know, you know, that confirmed that Congress has a right to criminalize patients. In this case, a lot of you might know Angel Rach. I've met her. She has an inoperable brain tumor, right? She was getting the medication from local California farmers for free, and it was unquestionably legal under state and local law. So not only was there no interstate commerce, there wasn't even any commerce. She was getting it for free. And yet, uh, as many of us know, the decision said that Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce is so vast that they could reach in and criminalize angel rape. So all of these years later, um, we have the chance to think about how Congress could use that power for good, right? And uh, on most days, all you really hear is, stop the delays, legalize cannabis, and let it just move ahead, right? Let, let Amazon and Altria figure it out. Let them do whatever they want. I guarantee you they have lawyers that are working on every possible detail. So what I would like to say to this room is think about that power that Congress has, the most, one of the most potent sources of power that it has. Think about your vision for what legalization could look like, and maybe you've held it for decades or more. I know I've, I've heard about mine from people like Dick. You can come up with a way that Congress can use that power to build exactly what we want the market to look like, despite what it looks like in the states currently, right? That can all be done through the power to regulate interstate commerce. So, uh, I think that's a big trigger, and I really, really encourage you to think about the details and not to cede that power uh, away from the movement and to the for-profit industry. What is the prospect that federal legalization, if it ever happens, might take a form similar to the 21st Amendment, the, which repealed the 18th Amendment, the Prohibition Amendment? In the 21st Amendment, the uh, uh, Feds basically got out of the way and turned the regulation of uh, uh, alcohol production, distribution, and transportation over to the states to handle. Is it possible that that might provide a model for federal reform? Might the feds just get out of the way, you think? I would have a very long uh, answer to that question, but I, it ties into what I wanted to say, so if you'll allow me. Go ahead, Dustin. And, and I just, um, I feel so honored to be here right now, uh, certainly not in Rick Doblin's seat, uh, but, uh, but thankful that it could be mine for today. This room is filled with people that I've admired since I started my life in cannabis activism 24 years ago or so, Ethan and Keith and Alan, Melanie Dreher, I, I mean, um, I'm really honored to be here right now. So I'm Dustin Sulak. I'm an osteopathic physician. I've been practicing in Maine for the last 13 years. Um, I had a little bit of a roundabout path to cannabis medicine because I started in cannabis activism and, um, and uh, really fighting the injustice of cannabis prohibition. And so here we are full circle. But my, my expertise is in medicine. And I think to answer your two questions about what is cannabis doing for social change and will our country come to its senses regarding drug policy? I'd like to use the metaphor of medicine uh, for what I think could happen at an even larger scale in uh, social and policy making governmental change. So right now, if you look at our medical system in this country, we spend more per capita on medicine than any other civilized, civilized nation, like westernized nation. We have the worst outcomes in terms of quality of life, efficiency of healthcare, uh, newborn survival, I mean, you name it, we are on the bottom of the list or second to last 
in almost every outcome, yet we spend more of our GDP on healthcare than any other country in the world. So there's something very wrong with how we're approaching health in this country. And I, if I had to distill it down to what is this very wrong thing, it's a centralization of control, centralization of decision making in medicine, which basically takes the autonomy out of the clinicians and out of the hands of the people that are on the front lines and puts it in the power of basically companies that are for profit, they're publicly traded, they control the government three letter agencies, and it's the decisions that they're making disempowering the, the people on the, uh, on the front lines of medicine that I think are turning medicine into this algorithmic system that has really backwards incentives and focusing on the wrong thing. So I, I just want to point out a few areas in which I see cannabis leading the transformation in medicine because it has to transform. All that it's doing right now is making people sick and keeping them sick and wasting a lot of money. It is not a sustainable business model. And when, um, when it no longer has access to the monetary spigot of the Fed and uh, you know, the downstream effects of um, our economic policy on supporting industries that are failing, I think medicine will be forced to change. So how will it change? I think in general, this change is reflected in a movement from centralization to decentralization. One example is that right now we are heavily over relying on monotherapies. These are single molecule drugs that have single targets in the body. This does not make any sense considering what we know about human physiology. That's a complex web of redundant interactions and, and, and pathways. Our, our biological understanding of systems is so far advanced in the other fields of biology, but that's not being applied to medicine. So it really doesn't make sense treating chronic disease with a single compound that has a single target. When you look at cannabis, even one compound in cannabis like THC has dozens of targets in the body. Now you take the whole plant with all of these multi-compounds with multi-targets in the body, you're seeing a, a much more holistic effect on, on our system and not just our physiology, but especially the endocannabinoid system. So we're already seeing this movement but it's, it's lacking in drug discovery, right? Drug discovery is still focused on the new, expensive, patentable, discovered molecule that's different from what happened before. But I see we're moving towards multi-compound, multi-target uh, interventions, and that changes the, the shape of the research. So right now, the gold standard is the randomized controlled double-blind trial. But if we were to zoom out and look at millions of people that are using cannabis all in different ways and thought about collecting their data to better understand how cannabis can be an even more effective treatment, not just for our most challenging and uncurable diseases, but also for preventing disease and promoting health, which we have evidence that it can do. This shifts the, the focus of research to big data, and it changes the question from does this new drug work to how does this work? And I think that's a, a much more important question. The, um, the medical authority is shifting based on cannabis also. We see you know, this old model of physicians, here's your prescription written in Latin, go take it and you don't know anything about it. And now the other side of this is patients that know more about their doctors, that, about the medicine that they're, they're taking. They know, the patients know about the cannabinoids and the terpenoids and the dosage range, the different delivery methods, and they're growing it at home for low cost. I mean, th this whole patient autonomy and patient empowerment is a huge shift in medicine, and it's not just related to cannabis. So cannabis is leading medicine towards herbal medicines, towards multi-compound, multi-target medicines, towards different types of population research, towards patient empowerment, towards less expensive, natural, repurposed uh, treatments instead of these brand new expensive ones, and then finally towards targeting the endocannabinoid system, which is this master regulatory system in, in our physiology, it controls the immune system, controls the, the um, uh, endocrine and hormone system, it controls everything in the body. And I think we're going to be seeing more treatments targeting the ECS, not just cannabis. They're going to be behind the counter in the pharmacy. They're going to be over the counter. They're going to be on the herbal shelf with the cannabis and so forth. So, um, you know, it, just, just to wrap this little rant up, I see cannabis really leading medicine forward in the ways in which it needs to be led forward to transform itself 
to stop failing our population and making everybody so sick. It's this decentralized um, um, systems kind of zoomed out approach. And I think that if cannabis can do that for medicine or help do that for medicine, I believe it can also help do that in a parallel way for our government, for the way that we regulate ourselves, which is also heavily centralized. And I think that that's problematic. Our model of democracy, what we call democracy right now, based on when we actually send someone on a horse to ride across the country to go represent us, we don't need that model anymore. I think we can imagine much more complexity-based models of self-governance. So like Cassandra said, the people, uh, are changing their internal drug policy, the drug policy amongst their social groups and their families, and even at the level of communications and media. We're not seeing that reflected a lot in the government now, but I think that this old infrastructure is just so badly outdated, inefficient, and failing to serve our, our needs as a, as a population that I, I think cannabis can lead it in the right direction. <clears throat> Thanks, Dustin. Let's come back to the question of the future of marijuana policy. Um, I'm interested in what's going on in Oregon. Uh, well, that's more than marijuana. But let's just talk about marijuana for a minute. In Massachusetts, we have, we were the, what, the fifth or sixth state to legalize, right? First on the East Coast. And we adopted what our friend Bill Downing calls the plutonium model, meaning we're regulating marijuana almost as if it were plutonium. You've got 200 pages of regulations in Massachusetts, and I think 300 pages in New York. Um, and I think the statute that was passed in Virginia last year was like 300 pages. I can't imagine. Why is regulation so complicated? Why do we regulate marijuana like plutonium? I mean. In my view, there are only two reasons to regulate marijuana. One is to keep it out of the hands of the children, out, out of the hands of children, and one is to protect the revenue. And Chile might add a third reason to that, and that is to, to keep a, a large monopolies from taking over. Uh, and that's legitimate. How, when are we going to get past this plutonium model? That's the question I have for the panel. Do you have any opt optimism that we might? Will some state realize that we don't? need to regulate it that way? Yeah, um, we're, we're definitely, no question, we're going to get past the plutonium model. Um, I do think, again, it could go either the oligopoly route or it could go the small business route, but either way, we're going to get past it. Um, I think it's going to take a little bit of patience because, honestly, regulations are a lot more complicated than we want them to be. Uh, and all of us in the legalization movement, um, we can't really abandon that question. You know, you can't say legalize, work to legalize, and then when it, once it's done, you know, pretend like it's not our problem anymore. We have to stay involved, and we should stay involved. Um, it also takes a little bit of patience, uh, and I have a Lester story about that. Thanks to you, Dick, when you introduced me to him. Uh, that was very early on in my term, and uh, we had... I had put forth a social consumption model that I thought was great. It was very progressive. It would have allowed um, any small business to incorporate marijuana use into uh, its business, massage studios, uh, yoga studios, theaters, et cetera, and uh, restaurants. Um, it, was, it was a lot. It was trying to do a lot at one time. And that day, it had been uh, pushed back. Um, by the governor, and I got to talk to Lester for the first time, and I was so mad, you know, and I was like trying to explain it, and he was like, I'm, I'm sorry, what happened? And we're sort of explaining it, and uh, he laughed with such joy. I don't want to say laughed at me, but his eyes were definitely sparkling, and we were all laughing, and it was this big picture moment of like, okay, we are not going to get all of that immediately in one day, right? And I think that we have to stop, do, do big, big, big picture things like come to these events and recognize that, but also keep talking about solutions and keep talking about details because it's not going to happen magically, right? If we want social consumption and cafes, we have to answer all of those questions, right? Who's going to regulate the food? Who's going to regulate the blah, blah, blah? Like it would take the whole hour. But we have to like really recognize um, that it is, in fact, difficult, and it's not just a bunch of dumb regulators overcomplicating things. You sure? 
Go ahead, Cassandra. Yeah, I mean, I'd also add that uh, our regulations are also um, largely influenced by fear still, right? Yes. Um, people are not regulating cannabis because, like, they're like, this makes sense, right? You're also being regulated by people who fear the regulation of cannabis. And so a lot of our regulations are also steeped in the propaganda around public safety, right? And so, you know, I think we see how far we've come in disrupting the stigma and the, the phobia around drugs based on the tenor of how the conversation of regulations is created, right? And I'm not saying that our regu that all regulators are coming from that public safety thing, but even our mo even the people that we put in place that are people, they have to contend with the fear and the stigma and the miseducation of other regulators and other like government infrastructures that are still operating from that place. And so it's you know it the consistently um, when regulators are having the conversation or what I've seen is like. They think about the worst case scenario that is honestly the least likely thing to happen, right? But that is what they're regulating from, not from the very the everyday experiences. And it's not to say that we shouldn't be preparing for the worst case scenario, but it's understanding that the regulations are coming out of that. And they're coming out of that because people are, despite the fact that we are regulating cannabis, that people, that people in power are still operating from a fear and a risk management space. Um, as opposed to a common sense place, which is how we all got to the fact that we need to regulate. And so I think that, that that's also something that um, is a part of the stuff that we're contending with, why they have uh, 300 pages, because the state is trying to reduce the risk associated with a litigious uh, community, right? Um, and those fears you know, are not unfounded because people do sue for everything, right? Um, and so I think that rec recognizing that uh, the culture around regulation um, is it's not just like dumb regulators. It's the fact that the bedrock of stigma and misinformation and miseducation and the propaganda around what is public safety is still shaping so much of our next step. You're absolutely right. When, when we were writing, when Shalane and I and the committee were writing the 2016 initiative in Massachusetts, we were told by the pollsters and the political experts that the voters, in order to get 51%, we had to convince the voters that the commission would have sufficient authority to control the new industry to prevent these horror stories that people fear. Now, they may not be real, but nevertheless, we had to provide that. So we argued during the campaign that, yes, the commission will have lots of authority, and it will, it will prevent these horror stories we're talking about. And so we gave the commission ample authority to pass regulations, and guess what they did with it? They passed them, <laughs> lots of them. Um, let's talk about the future. We're getting back to the future, not the past. Uh, I want to know about the future in terms of psychedelics and also uh, 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 Oregon. Oregon uh, decriminalized with the help of DPA. Oregon decriminalized all drugs uh, two years ago. What's happened in Oregon? Is, that, is Oregon the future? Absolutely. Tell us about it. I would think that Oregon, the conversation around decriminalizing all drugs, um, figuring out how we can create revenue streams to build out the infrastructure, the health infrastructure for people who struggle with drugs, is absolutely where we need to be and where we will continue to be pushing. It is, a, uh, it is the beacon and the North Star of the Drug Policy Alliance, which is to decriminalize drug possession, to decriminalize the instruments that people are using to decriminalize the spaces that people use, and actually to decriminalize the communities of people that are using drugs, right? Like, we recognize that decriminalization is, is the strategy for us to actually build common sense into society. Recognizing that criminalization as an intervention is one that is limiting, it's lazy, um, and it's not creative to deal with complicated layers of human behavior. Is that the DEA? <laughs> <laughs> Our meeting is at four. <laughs> Can I make 
Just sure. So, yeah, just in response to um, something you said about regulation, you know, I think a lot of us watched cannabis move from the world of criminalization into regulation and recognizing this kind of skipping the decrim uh, stage or end point, you know, I think what, learning that lesson from cannabis, what I'm seeing now in Maine with our efforts to uh, change the policy about psychedelic medicines is this real uh, emphasis on decriminalization because what, it, what can regulation do? You know, I, you mentioned, well, regulation is to keep it away from kids. I would challenge that. I don't think regulation keeps it away from kids at, at all. It didn't keep it away from me. And, you know, I, I had this thought when I was 15 and I realized I had been lied to about cannabis. What else are they lying to me about? And it really started at getting me to ask these questions. I think a society that has a healthy relationship with a strong plant medicine will develop that healthy relationship through the mechanisms of a complex adaptive system. And whenever you try to remove that decision making from that complex system and put it in the hands of the few regulators that think they can write a page or 200 pages of rules that's gonna somehow set up this healthy relationship, this safe, healthy relationship with this plant. It's, it's a fool's uh, errand. I, I really don't think that it's possible. What we see in Maine, uh, because we did not have any efforts to keep this away from children, we, we expanded our medical law in 2009, treating patients and treating families the, the kids are much less interested in cannabis if their parents are using it openly and not hiding it from them. This pathological lying that parents do to their kids about cannabis is the very thing that makes them go try it in a dangerous way before they're ready for it. And, um, you know, we have been disconnected from this vertical transmission of wisdom on how to use these substances for some generations now due to the criminalization and the illegality. And of course, there's gonna to be, to some extent, the pendulum swinging maybe a little bit the other way when we kind of rip off the Band-Aid and decriminalize. And I think there will be opportunities to attenuate some of the harm uh, from these substances becoming more available to young people. But I certainly don't think that regulation is gonna keep the young people safe. I think it's gonna just confuse the whole, the whole thing. Um, and so, well, that, that's pretty much what I wanted to say about regulation and I'm uh, very open, just as a side note to this, to hear what is happening in other states with the move to uh, decriminalize the psychedelics and just kind of plants and fungi and animals in general, you know, things in nature. Um, but I, I think that we're going to see more success if we focus on the decrim compared to the regulation. Well, you know. about Oregon in that, yes, it decriminalized um, and tried to set up like a regulatory medicinal um, setup for psychedelics. What I'm saying is that, and I agree with a lot of the things that you've said, what I'm offering is that the institution of prohibition, of all drug prohibition, is over. Like we literally have to take the institution of prohibition of all drugs off the table. And I and I understand because you name, right, cannabis and psychedelics as a thing that we have to move forward, but heroin and LSD and crack and cocaine all have to be decriminalized. There is no future in which a regulate a, 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 a conscious society regulates some drugs and decriminalizes some drugs and not others. It is a fool's errand. It is irresponsible. Um, and it is a waste of the billions of dollars of resources that are being poured into cannabis and psychedelics. Because there are people that are literally having, having to deal with the consequences of a fear-based model associated with plants and designer drugs, right? It's not just, there's also this fallacy that plant medicine is the error and the pinnacle of enlightenment. Like, that is bullshit. I'll take That is irresponsible. It's wrong. Right? Like there is this idea and this hierarchy that we ourselves as reformers reinforce in trying to say that there are certain drugs that are worth the discussion, that are worth the experimentation, while other drugs are like, oh, I'm sorry that that's your drug of choice. Like that is actually not what we can do. And so the future really is about building the, the, the infrastructure and the capacity of us to see people who choose to use different substances every day in their lives 
and not have to deal with the fears and the stigma and the misinformation that is, that is crippling us in navigating regulations, that is crippling us in being able to talk to each other, that is crippling us in being able to imagine what are the supports that we need in society. Prohibition, in general, needs to be over. And that understanding that prohibition is a choice, right? It's, it's not, um, you know, oftentimes we say, you know, prohibition, you know, that's how they thought they would regulate drugs, but that regulation is not really working. And we actually need to work for the regulation of all drugs. You know, prohibition is a choice. It is a market, right? Prohibition is a market, right? And regulation, the conversation of regulation is also a market. And I think the conversation that we need to have is like, what is, what is the structure that we actually need to do that reinforces people's liberty and freedoms, right? And oftentimes, the business model doesn't do that either. It does it for a small group of people, but not a broad span of people. And so the future for me, when we think about drugs, is what is the concept of exchange? What is the concept of bartering? What are the different economic models that we should be able to explore? Why should we concede that regulation means big business, right? Why should we concede that everything, you know, everything that is worth anything has to be a plant? Like, I think we have the opportunity to really expand what progress looks like um, and that we need to rigorously interrogate some of the principles that we've held, some of the um, communication strategies that we've held as well, because we're not actually going to get any further if we um, commit to an idea that we have to convince the scaredest person in the room that we are right. I'd like to talk about social equity a bit. I, we've touched on it a bit, but but I, our, the Massachusetts law um, was the first of legalization statutes or initiatives to address the historical injustice of prohibition. And uh, I'm very proud of that fact. Schilling was the leader, I should say, in our committee. I should thank her. She, she, she's the one who brought us those famous 35 words that says that the, the commission shall provide opportunities for members of communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the drug war and so forth. How well has it worked out? And what is the, uh, what is the future of social equity? Have we sufficiently addressed uh, those historical injustices? Are there better ways to do it than provide opportunities in the industry? Uh, first of all, it was very much a team effort and very much an ongoing team effort. Every day I would have a new update. Today the update is the bill that would correct a lot of these problems is currently in conference committee. Um, a great organization to follow is Equitable Opportunities Now. They'll tell you the play-by-play the -play and how we got here and how to get it passed, which has been by very much the people in the state, pri primarily led by people of color. Uh, but it's, it's an ongoing. We all know it's, it's ongoing and it's not easy. Um, I want to say something about imposter syndrome really quick that I think is, is relevant. I'm getting imposter syndrome for the first time at almost age 40 um, as I'm starting to work on federal policy and I'm realizing like this is really hard. I can't just quickly catch up, you know, and learn all of this and like, you know, write this great model that, you know, is going to work. And I'm realizing now in hindsight when we talk about equity, there are so many people who criticize but don't have solutions and don't have solutions with open minds. And I think that that is actually a form of imposter syndrome because it's so easy to criticize how social equity is going and, and the way it needs to go, which most of us already know. But it's very hard to propose the solution and then defend it, you know, with an open mind. And so what I would really encourage everyone in this room to do if you care about equity is to... First of all, um, learn about it, by the way. I have a paper called, it's a free uh, open to the public paper by the Ohio State University Drug Enforcement and Policy Center about how to incorporate social equity into cannabis laws, and then a companion paper about preventing monopolies. Uh, but what I would encourage you to do is learn as much as you can, and then please, please propose solutions, because the ones that do kind of work so far, um, the progress that we've made with delivery, the progress where we've made very strict regulations, a bit less strict for small businesses, those did all come from people you know, who work on these issues, not lawyers, not lobbyists. Um, 
And I'll end with this. I have been lobbied by the best paid lobbyists in the state. I saw how they work. They get so much money. They are not any smarter than the legalization movement. I can tell you that for a fact. So please don't have imposter syndrome. Please think of solutions and please bring them up openly, knowing that they may not be perfect, but we can workshop them among our community. We can try that. And that's the only way that we'll see positive change. What, what a, yeah. What, I, what I'd offer about the conversation around social equity, and Shailene and I talked about this last night, um, is that I think this goes back to one of the first things that I said, which is that uh, taking down prohibition and creating a different response to drugs gives us the opportunity to have broader responses to bigger societal issues because of the way drugs were used uh, to play kind of like the canary in the coal mine about our society's broader issues on people. Drug policy itself will not solve racism. It won't, right? And I think that in our quest to address the disproportionate impact of the enforcement, the racial discrimination um, that has occurred with drugs, we have um, in turn, try to put as if uh, legalizing cannabis or giving someone a license will heal centuries worth of racial discrimination and the subjugation of people. And I think that that has set us up for a narrative and a story and reputational failure. And when we think about the conversation about social equity, oftentimes when it is critiqued um, and people push back against me or our allies about social equity and how it's not working in cannabis, I often ask the person that is pushing back on me, where, are, where else are they working on social equity? Are you only working on social equity when it comes to cannabis? But are you also investing in the humanity and the equity of the people that have been disproportionately impacted by drug laws in other versions, in other places of their lives? Are you having conversations about policing? Are you having conversations about economic justice? Are you having conversations about education, um, the, the educational wealth gap, uh, the educational gap? Are you having conversations about the wealth gap? Where are you committed to equity? Or are you only committed to talking about how cannabis hasn't solved institutional, economic, and racial injustice? If that is the only marker in which that you measure equity, then I actually think that you are not an ally and a disruptor and a dissenter and someone that is trying to destabilize the broader experiment that we're trying to use drug policy to build. And so when we have conversations about social equity, it's understanding that the issues that are happening in cannabis around equity did not start with cannabis. It is that we're using cannabis as a way to build a broader conversation and build different strategies, right? It goes back to Shailene's point about if legalization means that the cannabis industry will look like every under, other industry in the world, that maybe we shouldn't do it. Like, that is a real conversation. And for me, that's also connected to equity, right? Which is like, if we are talking about making sure that people who have gotten um, impact, discriminated against through this process of prohibition, that they don't have the same space. It's recognizing that it's not just through regulations that we're actually going to reach racial equity, right? It's that it's through other issues that have to be acting in concert for us to get to a place where these policies are actually viable and actually able to survive and develop and thrive. That broader level of commitment is the question that I ask for us and is a future question about how are drug policy reformers showing up in the broader quest for humanity of people that are disproportionately impacted by our drug laws? Thank you. Questions, comments about the future? I have, I have two questions. Oh, 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 sorry. Yeah, I've got two questions. I'm, I'm curious, you know, the, the conversation about social equity, I wonder if, like, kind of the big obstruction here, are the barriers to entry in a market that's over-regulated that favors these companies that have larger access to capital and, and uh, political connections? And 
this, I, you know, looking at the future of psychedelics, does this bring us back to um, the decrim versus regulation? And I know that there's compromises that need to be made in order to, to move forward with policy changes. But I, I see if there was a level playing field and less barriers to entry, like we saw in Maine, uh, you know, with our small population, something like three and a half or 4,000 uh, licensed cannabis producers because it's $300 to get that license to be a, a certified caregiver. Like that low barrier to entry were then patients who are growing for themselves. Now they grow a little extra and they can start growing for somebody else, you know, and, and, and grow uh, a business slowly and organically in that way. So back to that decrim. The, the one question that I really have about the future though, this has been most important to me and I don't know the answer. Uh, for years, I thought that cannabis would lead the way and psychedelics would follow and that as these substances became more liberated and more available, uh, the effect on society would be similar to the effect on me, which was this movement towards individuality and knowing myself and expressing myself and this kind of mutualism, all, all the uh, like social values that you see shared in the cannabis community that I think we've all been hoping, like Lester described, you know, would spread to our wider humanity. Now I'm wondering, with the advanced technology in propaganda, with this more effective propaganda machine than we've ever seen, does the availability of cannabis and even more neuroplastic agents like the psychedelics make a population more susceptible to the mind control of those that have power and maybe moving not in the direction where I expect, expected it to move. And I know that's a, a broad question, but I, I think it's an important one for us to consider. Who's got a comment about the future? Peter. Got an answer? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, I mean, humans are constantly finding ourselves in a novel context that's so divergent from the one our species evolved in, and we have to use our intelligence and all the resources we can to cope with these unique challenges that are emerging. It, like super rewarding substances, whether they're legal or illegal, are, are a great example. And I, again, I don't think that a government's regulation is going to fix that problem, but we're going to need some kind of a an attempt to address that problem. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm thinking of one of my moral compasses. Cassandra is one. Carl Hart's one. You're one. Uh, there's a lot more. Peter's one. I could go on all day. But the one I'm thinking of right now is the uh, Transform Drug Policy Foundation, which is a think tank based in London. And they wrote a book about how the, the blueprint for legal and regulated drugs decades or more ago. Um, so a line in it that uh, really resonated with me was that if we end prohibition but give control to a small number of corporations that are, uh, that are motivated only by profit, it's as bad or, depending on the details, worse. And it's that question, I think, that really highlights it because rewarding, yes. Addictive, yes. Right? They're both, they're both true. And when we're talking about intoxicating substances, substances that we love, that make our lives better, um, we still have a really serious responsibility to make sure that uh, they're not going to be manipulated for profit. Mm -hmm. okay. Comment? Question? Carl? That's not Carl. No, go ahead, go ahead.
Well, that is a complicated question, and we don't have time for it. I'm sorry. Unless someone's got a short answer, short response. I just wonder if the free market and the decentralized complexity of, of the marketplace solves those things over time when the regulators start, stop messing with them. I just want to, yeah, no, 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 you go, no, go ahead. Real quickly, I just wanted to say that uh, Maine has done a lot of things, right? Because uh, I didn't get a chance to say that. Yeah, I completely agree when it comes to like keeping barriers low. Um, Maine and Oklahoma are both states that we can look at, and I think that when we have open competition, that solves a lot of the other problems we've been talking about. So those are the states to look at. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, panelists. Great job.